Hi, this is Charlie Montatuyella from BlueBearFlutes.com. Just wanted to bring you another question and answer uh, video today to answer some of the questions that some of our YouTube subscribers and viewers have asked that uh, may help answer some questions that everyone else has. So, uh, I'd love to go in order, but of course, you know, I never do that, so <laughs> I'm going to answer these in kind of a strange order from the way I have them here and, of course, uh, during the time frames that they've been asked. Uh, the first question that I have here that I'd like to answer is how to make a Native American flute key of D uh, is a video and it's from a user named Unior A. Uh, thank you for your videos. I want to ask how can I make a two octave flute? Have uh, I've tried many times and no success. Any recommendations? Thanks and keep making amazing flutes. Well, you know, thank you very much for your kind words. I appreciate you very much, and it's a very good, good question. Um, the second octave on a flute has to do with the speed and the mass of air that you can put inside of the flute. So, if you think back on a transverse flute, a silver flute that people play in orchestra, uh, they have a large mouthpiece that you can focus either a wide amount of air on to play low notes or a tiny amount of air on to play higher notes. So um, moving on from that type of flute to the next one, the kenna or the quenacho or the shakuhachi uh, from Japan. These type of flutes are what's known as a rim blown flute, but they also have a notch in them. And the rim blown flutes um, have something similar going on as does the transverse silver flute where you can blow either a wide strip of air or a medium or a narrow strip of air. And with this kind of thing, of course, you can control the speed that the air not only touches that edge of the fipple, I don't like using that word, anyway, the edge, the sound edge of the flute, um, <clears throat> you can control how fast the air touches that edge as well as how much air moves quickly through the flute. So similar to the, like the one that they play in orchestra, the silver flute, um, or even some Chinese flutes, which uh, have a great range, and a few Irish flutes have a little range, um, the, um, the kinnas and the quenachos and the shakuhachis, and for that matter, even the, uh, like the Anasazi uh, type rim blown flutes, or even a pan flute is a rim blown flute. Um, you can actually make those types of flutes that play more than one octave. The problem is getting the finer strip of air fast enough and large enough mass of it going through the flute that the vibrations of that sound vibration on the edge of the, the sound hole or the fibble, uh, that it um, will travel the vibrations through the flute at the same time. And I'd like to give you an example. I knew there was a reason I brought this flute with me. <clears throat> This is a, a flute that is kind of a standard, I guess, these days. It's a key of E, and uh, that's kind of a medium low tone type flute. The lower the tone of the flute, the larger it is in diameter and the longer it is. It's difficult to get a mass of air uh, to travel through this flute well enough that it'll, it'll take on these tiny, small vibrations. It's much easier to do that with a higher tone flute, with one that's smaller in diameter. So I can show you on this one, but you can imagine how it would be playing on a higher tone flute. It's actually a little easier to do what I'm going to do here. So this is the scale. That's the scale. I'm going to cover up these three fingerings and blow a little faster. You can hear it gets louder because I'm blowing more air. With this particular type of flute, since there's no embouchure being made by my mouth to control the airflow and the, the direction of the air, it's all made right here. This is your embouchure in here. Of course, you know, you can do things with your mouth up here that'll make a difference in the way the flute sounds. However, this is where the sound vibrations come from. So I'm covering up these holes and skipping several of the others. Now on this flute, I know from playing it a lot, that if I cover this hole up, just slight, let a slight little bit of air out of it and blow really fast and a little harder, it'll make the next note up.
the distinction is a lot easier on a smaller diameter flute because once again, small vibrations travel better in a small chamber than they do in a large chamber where they have the tendency to expand. So, how are you gonna make a flute that has more than one octave? The best way to do that is gonna be make it without the regular North American Indian mechanism up here that makes it play. It's easier to make a flute that you have to blow across that rim to play the extra octaves than it is to make one that doesn't. Now, having said that, there are people out there that sell some flutes that play a couple of extra notes in an octave. And the way that you achieve that is a very fine airstream coming through here on a very focused area. It just takes a little practice to get it exactly the way you want it and you'll play another three notes on top of what I just played. Um, that is really all there is to it. So I hope that answers your questions. Very, very good question. And of course, we'll be making some videos that are related to that here soon. Another really good question, does it matter if the bamboo is a lot thicker around than what it is on this video? The video, of course, is making a Native American flute using a hacksaw and a pocket knife, part one of three. So does it matter if the bamboo is a lot thicker? Now, the thing that we want to think about, there are two things that you have to concern yourself with when you're making a flute out of varying sized natural materials. The inside diameter is the thing that makes the sound of the flute. So that is going to determine if it's a high flute or a low flute, or if it's going to play based on this fingering or that fingering. So you'll need to know which size diameter that you're using to determine what size the, what placement of the fingerings needs to be. I hope that makes sense. Um, so that's one concern. The other concern is on, because I know a lot of you have noticed that even like this is our, our key of E flute and the walls are maybe uh, not even quite an eighth of an inch. We're talking about three and three quarters millimeters, I think is what I'm seeing there, which is pretty standard for our flutes. Some people make flutes that have a really thick wall and that's okay. Um, you get different tone qualities out of different thicknesses of wood. However, the single most important thing when you're making a Native American flute in this particular fashion that you want to concern yourself with it when it comes to thickness, and let me whip out my old uh, trusty pointing device. So, right here, um, the depth that this track area sits is, is really important. Uh, for making a good quality flute. It is best, in my opinion, and it's also listed in my flute making book, if the flat level here, when you're making a flute like this, is down at the, the level of the inside diameter opening of the flute. It gets a little confusing. There's a picture of a sailboat in my book, and it'll tell you everything you need to know. Um, and of course, there's people that build this area up. However, um, in the case of our flutes, we always build it down into the flute. Um, I've heard people, people's flutes that were built up like this, it sounded really great. And of course, for the sake of making our flutes, building it down I think works better. Um, that is really the only concern, is, is really where your sound edge is, where your track is, and, and how that works. So with depth and thickness, there's a little something that you'll need to adjust there to make it work. However, I've seen and made flutes out of bamboo with varying thicknesses and it, and it works great. So you can do that. Uh, of course, a thicker di diameter, uh, or rather a thicker wall thickness in bamboo is going to cause the flute to be harder and make a more crisp and really tight brassy sound, which some people prefer. Uh, kind of like that of, of like a black walnut flute. Here's another good one. Quick tip, how to fix a sound hole on a Native American flute. Let's see, and this is from IASOU 2005. More of a comment than a, than a question and a fantastic one. Super glue fumes hurt your eyes like hell. And that is true. They really do. Oh my gosh, stay away from this stuff. Um, super glue will stick your fingers together and it will, if it drips on like, like your mouth or something, it's just an annoying feeling. Don't ever get it in your eyes. The vapors are bad. Uh, I mean, everything around it is, is dangerous. It's something that needs to be handled as if it's a toxic chemical because in so many ways, the fumes do feel that way on you. So you are absolutely right, my friend. Very good comment and something I try to say in almost every video that I use super glue in. Keep that stuff away from your face, you know, <laughs> and uh, well-ventilated area, wear goggles. If you need gloves, wear gloves. Uh, 
just control the stuff and don't let it get out of hand. It is a very dangerous thing to deal with. And of course, as always, left the best one for last. And of course, it's the longest one. I don't know if you can see through this, but, but it is. It is from Josh S. And it's from the video that we made, uh, How to Make a Native American Flute Without Modern Tools. Good question. I get this uh, you know, pretty often. And I wanted to make sure that I answered it well and answered it honestly and truthfully and without coloring it in with fancy pixies and fairy dust. Uh, so this is the question. So would you have any advice on where to put the holes if you do not have a flute to use as a template or any type of measure tape of any sort, etc.? As if I am out walking about without my flute, and he puts in parentheses, it could happen, I think that's jokingly, um, and I come across the sawgrass and decided to make a flute. Fantastic tutorial, by the way. I see this is, as a new ritual for all upcoming camping, backpacking, etc. trips, which is, you know, wonderful. Thank you so much. We've actually been featured on a couple of, of like, uh, Outback videos and stuff from, from the UK, and um, we've uh, had, you know, we've, we've actually made several flutes that are perfect for backpacking and what have you. Um, so let's look at this from quickly from an engineering standpoint. If you want to make a flute that performs perfectly in this, that, or the other method, you can find a, a uh, once again, you're not going to do this out in the woods with a pocket knife. I'm going to get to that one last. But you can find an app that people have created. I don't know if it's available on Android or whatnot, but it is online. It's like a JavaScript that will determine the vibrational distance uh, between fingerings based on a given diameter and size material. And uh, that is the engineering version of it. So all you engineers, flock out and just Google it and you'll find it. I mean, I, I think I lost a friend because he created one of these uh, these type of programs to determine the size and fingering and whatnot uh, based on wind speed and all kinds of crazy stuff. And I, uh, I didn't admonish him enough. I didn't praise him for making such a thing enough. And I think he hasn't spoke to me since, which is really sad. Um, and the reason I don't, the reason I don't go that way, and the reason I say that all you engineers go ahead and turn, turn my video off and go find you an app or, or, or a program or whatever somewhere to do that, is because <clears throat> that is not a Native American flute, in my opinion. Um, you can make an Irish flute based on um, the sizes somebody told you. You can make a Native American flute based on that. You can make a Turkish flute, a Chinese tay. You can make anything based on exact measurements, precision, uh, glass-drawn pipe, copper tubing, anything like that. But there's one thing that you've got to have in here to make it happen. And um, when you start using those mechanical devices, and Josh, I know this isn't where you're going with your question. I just want to answer it because people ask that question a lot and they try to delve over into the other realm. I really appreciate the way that you asked it. And uh, you're actually heading the right direction. So thanks for that. I'll get to your answer in a second. But there's people that created this, this uh, program that you can find the size. There are so many variables that are not answered in that, including experience of the flute maker. I might not have made a key of A flute the same way yesterday as I did 20 years ago. And the way that I make it today requires the size to be a little different because of techniques and everything. The sound hole itself is a whole universe of, of variables just right there by itself. And if you use my book or my videos or anyone else's information about how to make a Native American flute and you do one little thing differently than they do right here, it may change all this this much. If you do two little things differently over here, it might change a little more and so on and so on. Um, it's always been my goal to tell everyone that you can change everything however you need to. Um, you can make a key of A flute that's an inch in diameter inside. It won't be the best one in my opinion, and you know it, it may be really well for you, a really great flute. However, you know those variable tools that offer the constants and the variations of this for that size, they will produce something in the realm of what it is that you're looking for. But you can also plug in the equation. You can make a flute that is a half inch in diameter and two and a half feet long and make a key of E out of it. 
However, the fingerings and the dissipation of the vibrations won't necessarily be the same. There's also another great variable, and that's your barometric pressure and the pressure of the atmosphere in general on this planet. It's like, what, 23 pounds per square foot or something? I forget. But, but those kind of things really go into using the scientific method to prove a Native American flu. Not completely necessary. We have lots of those laying around. Second version, of course, is you can use something, like I mentioned, uh, someone else's schematics, uh, because the, we've got lots of those in the back of our book, schematics on how to make everything. You can use schematics, patterns. I've actually got a couple of people that have asked, or rather have commented, thanks so much for making this video and showing your book. I screen captured the page that you use for your schematics. And I think that's the funniest thing and very, very not a problem. You know, that's great. You know, if you can't afford the book, screen capture those pages if you got to. Don't feel guilty about it. It's okay. Um, and if you don't have a flute, which is my first um, thing I would say that you should do to use as a pattern, which was in your question, and very, I mean, you're very wise, Josh. You got it going on, buddy. Um, so if you don't have a flute, which is my first choice for how to make another flute based on that flute's pattern, if you don't have that on hand, there are people out there that offer this bit of advice. Something about the distance from here to here and your thumb and your fingers and their measurements and all this kind of stuff. And this is claimed to be a traditional Native American system of making flutes. And all of you out there that use that technique for making your flutes, more power to you. Um, they may be more coincidences than original systems. Uh, by the time that the Native American flute really came back into play in, in the world of musical instruments, um, most of the people who had ever made one from scratch and didn't speak English, that only spoke their native language, that weren't affected in some way, shape, or form, whether it be by uh, organ makers or playing, you know, uh, Gregorian music on a kina, there may have only been 300 years ago that somebody had made the last flute from scratch without being affected by these other things. I can't say without asking that person if they used their knuckle measurements and their fingers and their elbow and stuff. I used to, when I went out and cut river cane, I would measure the distance between here and there on the river cane to determine if it made a good flute because I know that for the size flutes that I used to make, that was a good measure. In the shop yesterday, yesterday, I kid you not, I used a piece of string for measuring something. Measured it like this, I folded the measure in half, and there was a half of that distance. It works perfect. All peoples in the world have used techniques like this. The word foot that we use for a measurement of 12 inches in the old standard English measurement system comes from a foot, the thing on the end of your leg. <laughs> so you can, uh, you can use these systems, they work. That doesn't necessarily mean that they were original. Now, I think in my opinion, people probably used to sit around and say, hey, have you ever seen a flute like this? And the guy would say, no, no, can I borrow that to make a copy of it? And he would hand it over to him. And, and I know because I've done this before. The first Chinese uh, Tay that I ever made was based on one that my Chinese language teacher had brought into class. And I'm like, hey, that's really cool. Can I borrow it for a day? I took it home. I made a copy of it brought it back to your college next day. Um, and... And I made a pretty elaborate, pretty good copy of it, and I, I love it. It's a wonderful flute. It's an interesting instrument. Um, so uh, all these different types of instruments that you make, um, their or origination, when they were first born, created, however you want to say it, uh, the people that made them trial and errored a lot of stuff. And we know this because we found lots of their trials and errors, and uh, presumably. Because once again, we don't know, you know, if they're uh, thinking one thing and making the other. We don't know. However, I can tell you from making my own flute patterns for almost, for like 90% of the flutes that we, we use, um, it's been trial and error. And that's why I say that this size uh, diameter makes a good E flute and a smaller size diameter makes a good A flute because of the, the vibrations and how they travel. It's trial and error. These days, myself and my wife and probably a couple of other people I've met in life, um, can look at a piece of material and say, this is where those finger ends are going to go. If you want it to be a good flute, this is where you should put them. And it's just kind of a, I've seen so many of them at this point that that's how I would do it. But back 30 years ago, uh, making my first couple of flutes I ever made, I used a copy. And I, I made a copy from it. And 
that turned out pretty much like this one. So that's good. Um, otherwise, there is an old measurement that's in the back of a book that we talked about a lot that's the inside diameter should really be three quarters of an inch to a half an inch, but it says seven eighths. Uh, should be probably closer to half an inch. Five eighths makes a perfect one. Uh, you can travel from the sound hole to the uh, first fingering is four inches, and then it's an inch and three sixteenths from that one to that one to that one to that one, and so on and so on. And then you'll have to keep your finger covering that third fingering all the time. If you make it on a large diameter bore, and if you make it on a small diameter bore, then you won't have to keep that finger covered, and it does some wonderful things just like the old ones did. We have a video on making uh, the traditional six hole Native American flute. That's what I'm referring to. Um, but that's a good measurement. It's a good system of measure uh, if you want to do that kind of thing. Otherwise, when you pick that piece of material up, there is this that you have to work with. This and that, these and commitment. You make that first fingering. If it's a small diameter, move the next fingering down about the length of that diameter. Um, a little bit further is probably preferable. And then make the next fingering a little further than that, and a little further than that, and so on and so on. And when you drill a hole in there with your pocket knife that doesn't work, find something nearby that you can play it with. That's what we always did. That's what's always happened. It's trial and error. Josh, my friend, excellent question. Thank you so much, and I hope that you uh, find some use and meaning in this answer as well as everyone else. And... Uh, Thank you all very much for watching our videos. We appreciate you as always. We have some amazing videos coming up soon. I'm kind of smiling because I can't tell you about them because they'll kind of date me, I guess. But if you look back in the history and look at this video and say what video came two or three ones after it, oh my gosh, you guys are in for something wonderful. Anyway, I hope you enjoy this one as well as all of our other YouTube videos. Please visit us on our website, bluebearflutes.com. And also on our Facebook, find us the same way. A lot of places we're either listed as Blue Bear Flutes or Blue Bear Arts. And once again, my name is Charlie Matotuyela, signing out uh, for Blue Bear Flutes. You guys take care, have a wonderful day, and happy flute making.